All right. Well, thanks everybody for being here for night two. We've got, uh, as usual, some grounds to cover. I warned you in the email that went out at the beginning. This is the most dystopian of the three nights of the gospel according to technology. So uh, hang on, hang on for that. Um, we're getting some things that are kind of pretty tough, pretty tough to look at, pretty tough to realize. So let's uh, begin with prayer. I'll uh, give you thanks for all your gifts to us. Especially this gift you have given us of being able to co-create along with you. That is a tremendous gift and we thank you for it. We pray for the grace not to abuse it, but to use it for your glory and your purposes. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Can everybody hear me? Thumbs up? Thumbs down? No? It's pretty bad sound quality. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Not sure. Let's, oh, let me, let me close some things here. Hey, Mark, how are you coming on uh, getting to slide 22? Closing the program here, sorry. Okay, I don't want to zoom. That would be good. Yeah, I have uh, slide 22 up there sharing. Oh, do you? All I see is zoom. Oh, I think it's going to your browser instead. Oh, yeah, wow. it's sharing your browser. Yeah, well, could be the wrong window. There's too part too many open there. Uh, stop share. Try again. Share application. Here we go. How about now? There we go. Okay, go ahead. There it is. Excellent. Thank you, brother. Okay. Is everybody hearing me a little bit better now? Yes. Okay. Great. I closed a lot of things. Yes. Please let me know. Please let me know if uh, if it goes bad again. All right, well, let's start. Go on to the next slide, Mark. Let's start with uh, our case studies tonight. What with your, your homework for this week uh, was to think about a technology, either ancient or modern, and to think through the gospel story for that technology. Because we talked about the gospel isn't just for us, and it's not just for creation in general, it's also for the things we make. So each one of our technologies reflects God's created goodness and the way he made us. That's the creation part of the story. Um, it also has the potential to distance us from God and others. That's the fall part of the story. It has Ken, the potential to be redeemed. Poor audio, poor audio Ken. Hmm. I don't know what to do about that. Let's try this. Um, now you sound okay. Well, I'm not talking right now. It has the potential uh, to be redeemed, which is the redemption part, and it will one day be made new, which is the consummation aspect, the consummation aspect of the gospel. So let's stop me from talking. Let's listen to you guys. Who has, and feel free to use the hands uh, on, your, on your screen, raise your hand, use the reaction buttons. Who has the technology they'd like to share on? All right, Paul and Judy. You're still breaking up. Okay, well, it's your turn. You go, Paul and Judy. What would you like to share about? anything else? Well, the technology I picked is a pacemaker with a defibrillator, which I have, and very few people have. And uh, all my answers and so forth will be off of the pacemaker. Great. Do you want to share some answers? 
Uh, well, <clears throat> what happens if it stops working? I possible death. That's not a good thing. <laughs> uh, and number two is, Uh, is it possible to use a technology in a different way to avoid these problems? If not, how does this presence of such problems help us long for the future? No, a better pacemaker, period. <laughs> well, to me, it would be a better future is what you'd get. Yeah, better future, yeah. <laughs> If it quit working. <laughs> You can go ahead. Did you want to share anything else? No, that'll do it for <clears throat> right now. <laughs> Good. So, yeah. So a pacemaker is medical technology, right? So a specific kind of technology. Created good is that it keeps your heart working, right? Right. right. Potential for fall. Potential for us to use it to not trust God could be you put more trust in your pacemaker than you do in God to keep you alive. Not for sure, but a possibility. Or in doing healthy, healthy things that keep the pacemaker working right. That's right. That's right. Or using the pacemaker as an excuse not to do healthy things. Because <laughs> right. the pacemaker right. will save you. I that's haven't done that yet. <laughs> I don't think. But that's the way it could affect you in a negative way. You yeah, start because you're doing right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> that's awesome. Good. Cynthia, you had your hand up. Yeah, I had fun with this. Mine was also kind of medical. Um, so from creation, so mine is um, corrective lenses, contact lenses, eyeglasses. Um, so vision for creation. Vision is basic to who we are made in God's image. I assume he has 20-20 or better. Um, and corrective lenses extend the ability of vision impaired people to see. So I think that's part of creation probably. It, they enable vision impaired people to perform meaningful work and now allowing people like me to participate in creation. Um, they benefit society by reducing the number of people who have to depend on others for income or daily needs. Um, they enable users to, I wasn't sure about the produce or consume thing. I mean, they enable users to do both of those. And they enable users to see beauty and creation and people as God intended people to do. So that's what I had for creation. The fall, um, I mean, of course, you know, you can use it for good or evil, right? So you can see and use your eyeballs to engage in sin. So corrective vision, I suppose blind people don't sin in the same way that vision enabled people are, can. Um, people could take advantage of con uh, corrective lens users by mocking them. I, I was called four eyes, you know, as a kid, that kind of thing. That's stealing or destroying um, people made in God's image. Um, I realized that manufacturers can make these so that only wealthier people can afford them. So you create a have and have not kind of situation in the fall. Um, manufacturers can turn eyeglasses into fashion items, leading to over overpricing and artificial need, that kind of thing. Um, and for me personally, um, they can give the illusion that um, vision is a birthright, that it's something that we're entitled to rather than a gift from God. So I get frustrated as I get older and they can't fix my vision the way they used to be able to. Um, redemption, um, they, uh, corrective lens, lenses mitigate the effects of vision impairment that was introduced by the fall. Um, they enable, this overlapped with creation, so maybe I didn't do it right, but they enable God's people to continue to do his work in all kinds of ministry. They enable God's people to read and write and um, can be helpful in worshiping God. <clears throat> they, um, Christians can help to provide vision care um, for the less fortunate, giving them the gift of restored sight in a way that's kind of like a way of healing the blind, sort of. Um, and you ask about it being entertainment-based. And so, I mean, it's not primarily entertainment-based. It enables people to live fuller, more meaningful and connected lives. Um, in the consummation, um, 
let's see, why do I have that there? I don't know. Um, in the new city, we'll have new bodies, and I assume, I'm hoping, that we'll have perfect vision. Looking forward to that. Um, I don't know why that's there. I don't understand that point that I made. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that happens. Um, and how could I be involved? I loved that question. I don't have any skill in ophthalmology, but but it did make me realize that I can be involved in helping to support people who do. So I actually did some research and found out some, um, there's mis ministries just like the dental and medical missions. There's um, ministries that help with uh, giving eyeglasses or correction to people who need that, who can't afford it. Yeah. This was fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Good. Yeah. And not every, not every question will match. Those are just some helpful questions to help you think through each one. I, I love what you brought out the possibilities on the fall to treat vision like a birthright um, and to demand it and to get overly frustrated when you can't have it. Um, because you're so used to it just being fixed. Um, I love the idea actually in consummation that we will be able to see not just physical realities, but spiritual realities. And so just as our, our glasses help us see better physically, there'll be an extension to our sight spiritually in that day. And so it kind of extrapolates on in, in that direction. Who knows what that will look like, but that's a, that's a, fun, that's a fun place to process. Good. Maybe one more. Anybody else got a technology they were thinking through? Uh, Heidi, you're gonna have to unmute yourself. There we go. Can you hear me okay? It's not cracking. It sounds okay. Go for it. So mine was a little challenging and if you don't think it's good, I'll, you know, that's okay. I actually looked at the technology of birth control mm. and you know it's a little rough to put that one in creation because it seems like it's kind of going against it but um way to go for the non-controversial heidi well done i know <laughs> but it's had a huge impact on the last 50 years so Ooh. in light of what where you tend to take us, I thought it would be worth looking at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on the, on the pro side of birth control of any form, you could say that it offers women specifically an opportunity to uh, delay certain biological processes so that they can be uh, better prepared in the long haul to make a greater contribution to society. Mm -hmm. um, you could say that it is this debatable, but one argument I found was that it, it's a power differential. Um, uh, on the con though, and I wasn't sure how to handle that, uh, and if that falls into the act two, it seems to extend our sin, our appetite for pleasure or self-serving, regardless of uh, male or female, and that it separates covenant, family, and reproduction from the actual physical act. Mm -hmm. But if what I found for redemption is that it opens up a deeper conversation about creation and human sexuality and the mysteries of covenant as related to male and female. And that just offers us a way deeper look at, at how we manage conversations in modernity. And I think that for consummation, there's this, there's this opportunity because we'll be neither male nor female, neither Greek nor Jew, that it will give us insight of oh yeah that's why you wanted that like we'll m have a deeper understanding of what the trinity is all about and that's kind of as far as i got man that is that is a good start that is a good start okay so let's play this out can is everybody hearing me okay chat if you can't hear me okay um 
let's play this out. So for creation, let's think about the creational intent of sex and fruitfulness, right? Um, this is, uh, life is meant to be created in this relationship of mutual delight where both couples, uh, both members of a couple are um, prepared and consenting uh, to do this, right? Well, in the fall, there's lots of different ways that that goes off. I think that idea of power imbalance is actually a really important one. When you look in uh, certain cultural contexts um, where, where men have had power to do kind of what they want to do with women's bodies, even in the context of marriage, that um, there is a definite aspect of redemption of birth control of, of creating the opportunity for those relationships to be balanced a little bit and to kind of keep some of those uh, situations where uh, the man has power over the woman um, at bay and kind of even that out. The problem is, as you brought up in the fall, it creates a lot of power to control the situation, even when uh, those things aren't the case, even when uh, there are other desires that are behind it. It's an extremely powerful tool, an extremely powerful tool. Um, and so when we think about the technology of birth control, um, we have to take all aspects of that powerful tool into account and realize that things like our hookup culture today on our college campuses would not be possible without as in the way that we know it and understand it. It has long reaching ramifications, both that have done great good in certain parts of the world, um, but also that have led to some cultural side effects that are uh, pretty scary. Um, and so it's not, it's not a uniform verdict for birth control, just like it is for anything else. So I think you're right on the right path there and thinking through in each technology, like it has certain values and those values end up shaping not only the act of sex itself in the case of birth control, but also end up shaping the way we view sex and changing generationally what we think sex is actually for. If you were to say now that sex, the purpose of sex is directly tied to procreation, you would be laughed off the college campus because birth control has changed that conversation fundamentally. It has shaped us back as a society. Um, just as now, for example, I don't think twice about the fact that my eyes work. If I were born in the medieval period, I'd be blind and sitting on the street and you guys would all be like giving me scraps on the side of the road because I'm legally blind without my glasses. Um, I just have the expectation that that shouldn't be the case now because I've got lenses to correct. So these things change our expectations and change the way we see the world. They shape us even as we are using them to shape the world. So pastor, can you maybe expand a little bit how it, how it alters our need to uh, present the gospel? So whether it's the pacemaker, the glasses, or birth control, mm -hmm. they all kind of alter how we need to think about presenting gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, there's two sides to this. One is that any one of these technologies, I mean, some of them, like, you know, eyeglasses seem fairly more innocuous, others seem more debatable. All of them are potential idols that um, need to be addressed when we're proclaiming the gospel, that we are placing too much hope in these things, or we have allowed this thing to shape our view of the world such that we no longer see it as it actually is. Um, the other aspect of this, though, is that God uses um, technology um, to frame our understanding of who he is. Almost any time a new technology gets introduced in the, biblical, uh, in the biblical world, God turns around and uses it as an illustration, as an example of the way he works in our lives. So think of how many messages you've heard where eyeglasses were, uh, were in a, an example used to explain some aspect of how God works in our lives. Now that the Holy Spirit comes, we can finally see, and that's like our glasses and et cetera, et cetera. So I think these technological tools both present obstacles, but also opportunities as we're sharing the gospel. New ways of understanding how God works 
um, but also new obstacles to, we, we don't always see the world as it is. It also puts a greater distance between us and the biblical text. So it's more work to get us back into the day where, man, healing somebody's eyes, that was a massive deal. And we just kind of like, I mean, yeah, it's a cool miracle. Like in their world, that would have been utterly life-changing, but we do it all the time. So it can create a, a little bit more difficulty getting into the biblical text sometimes because we're, we're farther removed from the situation that they were in. And uh, their, the impact of that healing would be different than the impact of that healing today. Um, there might be other things that we can't still do that would help us make the analogy there. But there are several aspects, several, several aspects of that. We're going to get into tonight how, um, how one particular technology is, uh, is transforming us and changes the way we view the gospel. Mark, if you can go to the next slide. We're going to talk about digital technology and specifically personal digital technology. There are about a trillion conversations that we can have about different kinds of modern technology. And there's a great danger um, in not recognizing that we are zooming in and focusing on just one aspect of this. Um, we could talk about, if we wanted to, industrial technology, machines that are making new goods and how that's affecting our culture. This is actually, if you remember in the Democratic primary, Andrew Yang, this was his big issue with how industrial technology is changing the very fabric of our society and his solution was to give everybody a certain amount of money. But what he was really concerned about was um, automation in business. And there's a million things we could talk about there and job loss and et cetera, et cetera. Then you could also talk about medical technology, um, the pacemaker example, and how that influences our lives, how that creates an expectation sometimes that we will be able to live forever how a huge chunk of our medical costs, which we can't get under control as a society, are because we continue to demand that we, uh, every single intervention we can possibly have, that we should have the right to and we should be able to get. Well, all those interventions that we create, every machine just becomes more and more expensive. And so that's a huge part of why medical costs rise. So there are all kinds of things we could say about all those things, but we're not gonna say anything about them because <laughs> we only have time to talk about the one thing, which is our personal digital technology. And kind of under this, I'm doing the big three in terms of technology for our personal lives. The big three, the internet, smartphones, and social media. Where we're gonna go from here kind of lumps together those three technologies as a primary uh, digital personal technology that affects each one of us every day. We could talk about the industrial and the medical. That would apply to some of us, but not all of us. Internet, smartphone, and social media impact all three of us. As we said, uh, all of us. Um, as we said last week, the internet is a combination of the book um, in terms of written type now being permanent and accessible in one place. The photograph being able to duplicate images the telegraph being able to transmit information over long distances, and the telephone, which allows us to connect people over long distances. It is a powerful technology. Then you take that technology and you put it in our pockets all the time to where we always have access to it, and that's what a smartphone is. It's basically the internet portable and, oh yeah, we can still make calls to somebody if we want to, um, over the uh, over the lines and then you take social media and when you think about it social media actually becomes our own personal internet that is crafted just for us the things we really care about that we can do with the internet um, images status updates people etc cetera, etc cetera, that all gets funneled to us to where Facebook uh, or Instagram to a lesser extent but they kind of become an internet within the internet that is centered totally around us and what we're about, okay? So these are kind of the big three pieces of personal digital technology for our personal lives. And that's what we're gonna focus on uh, tonight. We're gonna talk about the values that are inherent in that personal digital technology and how that kind of 
we use it to shape the world, but then how it boomerangs back and shapes us. Now, a caveat before we get started, the experience of these technologies is gonna be different for digital immigrants versus digital natives, as we talked about last time. If you're a latecomer to these technologies, as Peter Grigg, who was on last week said, um, if you're a latecomer to these technologies, then you will get on them and then get off them and it will impact you while it's on them, but then you'll be off. Digital natives are not getting on and off. They are always on these technologies. So I may make some claims and say some things tonight, which seem kind of intense. Keep in mind, there is somebody who is using the technology more than you are. Um, and, and, and so some of these observations and some of these research studies come from um, uh, some, of the, some of the digital natives, uh, not just the immigrants. So I want to unearth, we talked about how each technology has a, val has a value system, right? Has a value system. It has a, a, a current that it is taking you down that shapes you um, no matter what. Technology is not neutral. It has values to it. And in this personal digital technological realm, I kind of picked out, there's a bunch you could pick, but I kind of picked out four key values. Access speed, ease, and personalization, okay? Let's talk about how each one of these values comes back and impacts us for good and ill. Let's go to access. We can now access everything. There is almost nothing off limits to us anymore. And if we find that something is off limits behind a paywall, for example, we get ticked. <laughs> we get mad because we now have the expectation that everything will be right at our fingertips. And now with Google, um, we can search things much better than we used to be able to. So now we even can search this massive amount of data. Now there is good there because before, we were able to access everything, we were limited to the knowledge that was in our natural networks wherever we were. And for the strange, unique parts of existence, that's a problem. My grandmother was one of the first people in the US diagnosed with celiac sprue disease. If some of you guys know that, it's, it's, it was the original gluten-free um, disease. And she was on the forefront of this but it went undiagnosed for years because there were isolated cases around, but not enough in any one place for the medical community to get together and kind of put it on the radar in a sense to figure out what it was. Um, I remember my grandma growing up, people would write into her when they were diagnosed with celiac because she was kind of the maven of celiac recipes. They would write into her and she would write them back with the recipes that they could use. And she would scour the stores for all the gluten-free stuff and make huge lists. And she provided some of that new stuff. She is like rolling in her grave with delight that it has suddenly become cool to be gluten intolerant. And like, uh, and, 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 and she's just having a blast. Things like the internet make that kind of interaction possible because people who have it are spread out such the incidence is low enough that they're not all in one place to where they can really share notes. The internet allows us to do that. Um, Bible teaching, which you would have never had access to before, is on the internet. Um, people read their Bible more when they use an app than when they read on paper because it's available. They have access to it right there. They read more often. Now, there's another problem with that. We'll talk about that, but um, all kinds of different aspects of where this is good. Also, the people we love who are not immediately available to us, we now have access to that we didn't before. So it's access to information and relationships. The bad is there's a lot of bad things that we now have access to. Our work machines are now our personal machines, are now our porn machines. They're all the same machine. And we have access to all of it at the click of a button. There's now no way, there is no authority 
who is now vetting information before it gets to us. Fake news, however you want to define fake news, whichever side you're on you think is fake news. There is no more authority because we have access to anything anybody wants to put up there. Human nature is writ large and we have access to all of it on the internet. Relationally, we have access to people we don't actually care about. <laughs> we have access to people who we have no relationship with, just like we have access to the people who we do have previous relationship with. We've got it all. And the problem is, is, is we lose our ability to truly integrate anything, uh, all these different pieces of information. There's actually been studies that suggest that when we get too much data to make a decision, our prefrontal cortex, which is, is what integrates uh, data to help us make a wise decision, actually shuts down. The more data you get, at some point your brain shuts off and you can't process it anymore. And when I scroll through my Facebook feed, just an example, and see this person who is wildly against this person, who's making a claim that's directly against this person, I, I go like four status updates and I'm already overwhelmed and I, I, I don't know how to put the different pieces together. There is such a thing as too much access. There is such a thing as too many flavors of ice cream to choose from. And so what's happening is that we're gaining factoids or at least uh, opinionoids, but we don't know how to put them into a larger picture of what's actually true in the world. We don't know how to integrate them. It's a huge problem. When we talk about fake news is a problem, we talk about um, you know, easy access to this and, and that is a problem. And underneath that problem is this value of the internet saying, you can access anything you want, anytime you want with no filters. All right, that leads to the next value, speed. We can now access everything and everyone faster than we ever could. We can do it immediately. No need to look up. All this knowledge was available if you knew how to work your way through the Dewey Decimal System and you had plenty of time to write. You don't need that anymore. <laughs> you don't need that. All you gotta do is do a quick Google search and it's right there at your fingertips. Now the good is that we have greater efficiency to get more done and we don't have to, uh, 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 or co to connect more often. We don't have to waste time in a sense with bits of information we don't need to know. We can go straight to the source. Uh, our ability to multitask increases. The bad is that anything you do fast, you do more shallow. Our connections with the information or with the people we're running across, when we do things fast, makes that connection not as deep. There was a study that was done that talked about the difference between scanning and uh, reading, sorry, reading uh, on the internet and reading uh, in a book. And then they did a retention test. They found that if they told the people, you have five minutes to read this internet article and five minutes to read the article in print, the two groups, you had the same amount of time, people actually retained about the same amount. But if you did not give them a time limit, if you did not say you've got to spend five minutes with this, if you just said read this and then take a test, they found that the people who were reading on the internet did it way faster and retained way less than the people who read on the print because it was their natural posture now to read fast online. It was automatic. They got online, they read faster and they retained less. It wasn't that that was necessarily true if they had taken the same amount of time, but they didn't. They automatically started reading faster. So what we've developed is this new skill of scanning reading versus reflective reading. When we're reading online, we are not actually reading in the same way we then, as we are reading a book. We are reading fundamentally differently. It may seem like it's the same task, but it's not. You're looking for key words. You're, you're skipping sentences. You're reading differently. Then when you sit down with a book, 
um, or with the Bible, um, hopefully, and you sit and you meditate and you, and you ponder. I mean, how often have you sat with an internet article and pondered, right, each line? You might do it, but you don't do it as easily as you would do it in a book because there's this natural, uh, there's this natural urge to, to keep scrolling, keep going, keep going. They're different skills. One is valuable in one way, one is valuable in another way. But if you only do one of them, you lose the skill in the other domain. There's a difference between check-ins and searching conversation, right? Um, I send a lot of emails. As many of you know, you probably get a lot of emails from me, right? And it's different getting an email than it is sitting down and having a conversation across the table. One is a quick check-in or something based on a task. The other is, is a person-to-person -person interaction. If we talk to each other like we talk to each other in emails, we would consider it very rude, right? If you just dictated an email to somebody, you'd be like, why are they being so gruff with me? It's a different conversational skill. It's a different way of relating and it's changing. That examples could be multiplied to text messages and everything else. It's changing the way we even think about intimacy and the way younger generations think about intimacy. So the ugly of this is we are losing our ability to reflect and ponder because we are spending so much time online. That re reflective reading is giving way to the scanning reading. And we really have to do that reflective reading in order to turn factoids and information into what David Brooks calls uh, a, a crystallized, no, in, uh, crystallized knowledge. It has to set for a little while and crystallize. You have to be able to make connections between this thing and that thing, and that just takes time, especially with the breadth of facts we're now uh, exposed to. We need even more time than ever to integrate them. But the medium itself fosters speed. The other thing is we're never paying total attention to anything anymore. We're always paying partial attention to, to this or that um, going on over here. I'm talking to you, but I've also got my phone open and my computer's open and et cetera, et cetera. We all experience that because everything feels immediate. Everything feels like it needs to be done right now when it pops up on our phone. A book is not chirping at us to like pick it back up. Our phones are. It values, values speed. Okay, two more and then we'll do some questions. Ease. Very little is required of you in the online environment. There's a reason that two-year-olds can pick up a tablet and figure their way around it like that. You don't have to be super smart to figure this out. Now, if you're a digital immigrant, okay, that's a little bit different hurdle because you're used to operating in this other way. But they make these things to be as intuitive and to ha have as much ease as possible. The good of that is, for example, our brother Tate. It's great to have Tate on technology and to have him be able to chat, to have him be able to email. It enables him. Uh, uh, he's a, a friend here at IEC, for those who don't know, is CP. He, uh, it enables him to communicate in ways that you would never know he would be able to communicate otherwise. It's a game changer. Absolute game changer. It also allows us to hop back and forth between different areas of our lives quickly, which can be helpful in some cases. I was listening to a TED talk the other day about how technology, it used to be before the industrial revolution that home and work were the same place. You did everything together. And then in the industrial revolution, you had to go off to the factory to do your work and your family was left at home. And now we have this workspace and this private space. Well, one of the things that the fact that this is so easy to use, one of the things it allows me to do is pull it out real quick, connect with my family in between a meeting and put it back down. That line between work and home is now blended, which has some negatives, but all obviously some positives. Um, you can really pay more attention to the people that are closest to you because it's so easy to use. The bad is that when something is too easy to use, we begin to take the easy way out. We begin to rely on that ease instead of 
making the effort to do the things that are harder. In short, we become consumers instead of creators. It's way easier to listen to music versus learning to create it. Our smartphones don't teach us how to play the piano other than if we're watching a YouTube video, right? But they'll play music for us all day long for us to listen to. Right? It's really hard to paint a picture. It's really hard to create something that's beautiful in graphic design. But man, is it easy to pull up something that is absolutely mesmerizing to the eyes on this. You get the payoff without the effort put in to actually figure out how you create things. In relationships, there are a couple of things that happen here with the ease. One is that we have what's sometimes called ambient intimacy. I love this phrase. You have ambient intimacy by knowing what's going on in a person's life without ever having connected with them personally. So think about Facebook stalking, right? <laughs> As one example of this. I could Facebook stalk some new congregant and go six months back after we've become friends. And I can feel like, man, I kind of know this person. Like I'm kind of in on their lives. There's an ambient intimacy, but I've never actually talked to them. It gives the illusion that I actually know that person. When as all of us know, Facebook is not necessarily what's actually true or going on. Um, Another uh, phenomenon that Sherry Turkle talks about is being alone together. Is that we're all feeling lonely, but we're doing it in the same digital space. That when we're posting something or when we're connecting with someone online, there's the illusion of presence, but somehow that illusion leaves us feeling starved. Think Zoom. And you'll get exactly what she's talking about here. What ends up happening if this is one of our main places of all we're given is this ease of accessing information or accessing people is we lose the ability to sustain effort towards anything difficult. And so we begin to escape into what's easy at the first sign of trouble and that has escape becomes habitual. It is easier to text a breakup than it is to break up with someone in person. So people escape into it. It is easier to get a Facebook like than it is to have a sustained relationship with someone and hang on for that word of affirmation. And so that's what we escape into. Next and last is personalization. One of the primary values of our personal devices and of the internet is that everything becomes tailored to you and your needs. Everything becomes tailored to what you want, when you want it, how you want it. Okay, in one sense, this is good. You're not bored very much. Um, you also, as we talked about earlier, don't have to waste time with, uh, with all these extraneous things that you don't care about. You can focus just on what you care about. The problem is, is that there are important things that we don't necessarily care about. Part of growth and maturation in an individual is looking beyond what you immediately think is important and begin to discover other things that are important. Having something too personalized just to creates a bubble of what you already like. The other aspect of this is that because we have so much control on like a social media site is that we can even personalize our appearance to the world the self we present to others. We can personalize our person and make us look the way we want to look to others without the messiness of how we actually look. We can pick the perfect photo as opposed to the awkward one where like, you know, our like one eye is half closed, et cetera, et cetera. 
This has been one of the most distracting things to me about Zoom is that I cannot control the way I look on the screen. And I end up looking at myself on the screen a lot because I'm really disturbed at how I look. Because <laughs> I can't control it. I can't craft it like I can say in a Facebook post. What this ends up doing over time is it creates an alternate reality where we are constantly thinking about ourselves and what we want to think about. We never have to interact with those who think differently from us, with those uh, if we don't want to. Um, we never have to interact with, uh, with the, the uglier sides of ourselves. We can create our own bubble and our own image that's broadcasting out to the world. And so we have to think, uh, that's true, Matt, thank you. Um, you can control in the sense you can hide yourself. You. Um, I need to know where I am in the shop though. Um, <laughs> you, you, you create a world where you have to think about yourself far more than you do in normal relationships. Now, this is where it gets even uglier because this reality, this focus on ourselves is actually fostered by the companies who are putting this stuff out because they are competing for your attention. They want you to think about yourself. And here's where we get into dystopia a little bit. Go to the next one. Mark. The business model of personal technology is that you are the product. Think about it. If you don't pay for Facebook, who's paying Facebook's bills? The advertisers are paying Facebook's bills. The power of Facebook is yes, to connect you with others. But it is also to get information on you so that advertisers can give you the most focused ad that is going to be the most likely to hit you in what you already want. They don't have to guess. They don't have to throw out something that like is going to hit 30,000 people, but it's only going to really matter to, to 500. They don't have to pay for the 30,000. They just have to pay for the 500 when they know exactly what you want and exactly what you like. So the purpose of things like Facebook, of things like Google ads is yes, to give you what you already want, which is dangerous in and of itself, as we just said, but it is also to get information on you so the next time they get a Google ad to you, you are more likely to click on it because you are the product and your data is the product that they are selling to advertising companies, both in a specific form with advertisements and then in the, in the macro sense with big data, which is a whole nother, whole nother aspect of this. And the tools they use to keep you coming back to thinking about yourself and what you like and what you want is first, they ding at you with an interruption, all right? Again, books don't ding at you, <laughs> phones do. They want you to turn to the phone because if you're off the phone, they're not getting any ad revenue off of that. They need you on the phone in order for you to see some type of advertisement. Then what they will do is they will stimulate either a sense or an emotion that is most likely to keep your eyes glued to the screen. Tristan Harris, if you've never heard of Tristan Harris, he used to work uh, for Google in the lab that kind of works on some of this and he's now kind of like become the canary in the coal mine sort of guy. Fascinating, he talks about how the, really the race of these companies to keep your attention is a race to the bottom of the brain stem. It's a race to get to the bottom of your lizard brain to do things as ex instinctually as possible. So for example, reflection is not very instinctual. It takes time. Outrage hooks you in. 
And so there is a motivation for companies to put outrage, things that will outrage you in front of your eyes so that you will stay on. That is what their news feeds are trying to put in front of your eyes. As well as things like personal connections, those who are close to you, et cetera. Videos, another great example. Our brains are trained to focus on moving color images. So there's a reason that as soon as the tech became good enough, Facebook started to automatically start videos instead of you having to start them. Because if they automatically start the video for you, you're much more likely to stay on than if the video, if you had to click on it to get it going. Because a moving color picture is much more enticing than a, than a, than a still color picture. And then to keep you on, they continue the loop, right? The next video starts automatically. Next video starts automatically. That's built in to keep you on to get more advertising revenue. So this personalization, this desire that we have for, for um, I want to pay attention to what I want to pay attention to. I, I want to go after what I think is good and right ends up backfiring because they are now so good at putting in front of your eyes what you think is good and right. That it sucks you in and you lose the ability, at least to easily pull yourself out because it's what you want after all. All right, we're knee deep in dystopia. Questions, thoughts. We'll stop here for a second. Keep, go back, go back. We'll stop here for a second. Feel free to unmute yourself or put it in chat, either way. Can I talk? Yeah, go for it, Monica. Okay. Um, I, uh, I, maybe I missed it, but at one point back here when you were talking about self, if I can go back, let's see what's, there was a self slide where you talked about becoming psychologically addicted to yes. yourself mm -hmm. or like to being yourself. I, can you make a comment on that or? Yeah, I miss it? so yeah, I didn't say that, sorry. But there's kind of two layers of this. One is that we um, already are inwardly curved, as Martin mm -hmm. Luther and then Augustine said, by nature, right? Right. Um, right. We, we already think about ourselves a fair amount. Um, right. In this medium, that kind of inward curvature is sort of celebrated, championed, and continually given to us to tweak. Hmm. So, so kind of that desire that we usually have to think about ourselves is just magnified because every time you open Facebook, it says, how are you doing today? <laughs> or what are you feeling today? It's prompting you every single time you get on, not to think about someone else, but to think about yourself. Okay. It's built into the system. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So then on the, on the other side, physiologically habit forming um, on, the, on the, what the companies are doing is mm -hmm. by putting videos in front of you, right? And by, by tapping into those base emotions, there's actually research happening that it starts to rewire our brain, shorten our attention spans, et cetera, where it becomes habit forming that I need to see a video. This is seen mm -hmm. with kids who watch too much TV at an early age, right? They mm -hmm. get attention disorders because, mm -hmm. um, they crave the video now. Mm -hmm. So that's, there are things that are happening in our brains over time because of the rate at which they're, they're putting things in front of our faces. But that's a different kind of, that's a different kind of habit forming than just like, I like to think about myself. Um, and now yeah. I'm being asked all the time, what do I think about everything? Hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. This is Gina. Can I ask a question? Go for it, Gina. So I was wondering, um, and I, I'll have to try to articulate it out loud while I'm thinking, um, how much of this would you say is parallel 
to similar things at other points in history expressed in new technology and how much of it is completely new. Um, like you brought up the fake news thing and I, I've been reading a book called The Image by Daniel Borston written in the yeah. 1960s about um, all the pseudo events that were being created in newspapers at the time and um, before television and then after television. And I'm of the age where we grew up with the advent of video games and a lot of cautions and fears about the addictiveness of video games. Um, so I just see a lot, of, a lot of what you're describing sounds like parallels to other historical developments of technology, but maybe we didn't have the means then to study what was going on in the brain. But I think there are some things about this that are new. So I was just wondering if you could address that. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think it's I think it's both and, you know what I mean? There are some things which are similar. I mean, fake news did not start in this era. You know what I mean? Like that is that is people who would control the media for their own ends, um, for example, um, have always existed. I think the difference now is the scope of it. There's 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 so much information that fact checking becomes almost impossible, at least from a, a, a an individual's point of view. Um, I think, uh, yeah, we do have some ways now to think about uh, video games, uh, or sorry, think about videos and their impact on the brain that we didn't have before. But again, it's the scope of the videos um, that is just mind numbing and the pace at which the technology is changing. Um, the pace is stunning. So what we're really doing with these products, especially with our kids, is we're kind of experimenting on them. What does this do to human nature? And before we've got the results of, of one sort of technological advance, we've already made three more. Um, I mean, the, 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 the jump from internet to cell phone to smartphone was... I mean, really, barely 10 years. I mean, there's a lot you don't know in that amount of time on how something shapes a society before we start putting it in everybody's pockets. Um, and then social networks on top of that. So there's a lot of good here, like, please hear me. But the pace at which things are changing, I think, is new. It's very new. And the scope that we now have in terms of access and speed is new. There's a difference in quantity of each one of those things, but I also think some potentially fundamental difference in quality to where we really have to start thinking about how is this shaping us? Now, what will happen as happens in each one of these technological innovations is some of those negatives get subsumed into, well, this is just the way things are, right? the automobile that Heidi points out in the chat here, right, is, is huge. We now accept car deaths as an acceptable form of acceptable risk that we take in society to be able to get from one place to the other. That's just normal when it wasn't always that way. That just got roped in as, you know, we're willing to make the sacrifice of these uh, gruesome traffic accidents for the convenience of getting wherever we want to go. As a society, we'll make the same bargains with this technology. The call for us as we're on the cusp of this is to think long and hard about what are the costs so that we individually in our own formation and as a church can think long and hard about, okay, is this, this may be a cost that society is willing to make, but is this the cost that I am willing to make? That's new. Adding on to your last couple of comments, um, Ken, about how it's a con and pro and a cost versus benefit for society mm -hmm. versus the church. Mm -hmm. um, they're hired. There are a lot of 
I guess, social expectations that you are watching the show that everybody's watching, that you're on Facebook interacting with so-and-so's likes and dislikes. It makes it very difficult to have any kind of relationship where you have decided personally to plug out of those things. Yep. So, and then do you have any insight on how to manage your own personal need to be unplugged versus your ability to interact? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's next. That's next class. Of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's the next class is, is what do we do with this? Because I'm painting like I'm giving sort of the scariest aspects of this and how it's shaping us. Um, there are goods to these things, very good things to these things. We see those more readily like, oh, we can connect with people that we wouldn't be able to connect with otherwise. Like in a pandemic, Zoom is super helpful. I don't know that I ever want to use it again after this is over, but right now I kind of love it. Um, and, and, and it's a gift. Um, but that doesn't mean we need to be uncritical about the ways we approach it. And so that's, that's some of what we're going to talk about in the next class is now, how do we, how do we walk into this in a way that is both thoughtful, um, but also faithful? My daughter has just walked in. Hi. You want to see everybody? Yeah. Hi. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> okay. All right. I got to finish up. Okay. And can I share? No, oh, sorry. Can I share? Public and private worlds colliding. Work and home worlds colliding right here. Technology allows it to happen. If we were at the church, that wouldn't have happened. So there's good to that. Um... I will do that here in just a minute, Gary and Beth. Ken, can I share one thing quick? Yeah, go for it, Noah. Um, I think one thought I heard someone share is that it doesn't think about losing control. Um, when, we, when you read a book, you construct that world in your mind. Mm -hmm. And that takes work. That's creating power. Yes. But when you watch a video, that, that world is, um, what's the word, impressed upon you. You conform to that world that already exists. Um, and I think, I imagine that affects our brains and how they work and stuff too. Totally. So Absolutely. just, and we're letting someone else dictate. I mean, it, that happens to some degree with the book, but we're letting someone else dictate how we, even the interpretation of things, not just what we read or whatever too. So. Exactly. And the same trans or a similar transformation happened when we went from spoken word to a book right? Because now you don't have control over the words. You don't have to memorize the words. They're there for you. So we lost our need to have to memorize things once things came into a book. Whereas in oral societies, like they had an incredible ability to memorize. So the deal we made was that we'll give up our ability to memorize in the book so that now it's all written down now I can start to pull these things together in greater integrated holes because now I don't have to remember it all. It's a different type of thinking that we became able to do when the book came along. And so in a similar way, this is changing the ways we think. Some probably good, but there's a lot of drawback when you start providing everything for how your brain is going to process and you don't require anything of your brain to... Um, to pull that information together. So again, it's a value. There's some good in it. We just have to be aware of what the value is so we're not being shaped unthoughtfully. No. So let's keep going. What are the potential implications of this spiritually, culturally, society? Go to the invitation to flourishing, 2 John 12. We talked about this last time. Uh, 2 John 12, one of my favorite uh, technology verses in the Bible. Um, I wanted, uh, you know, I could write to you with pen and ink, but I want to see you face to face so that my joy is complete. John is pushing back against this technology of pen and ink, not totally, but as an expression of the fullness of his desire to be with his people. He talks about full joy is embodied presence. Full joy is embodied presence presence. The Christian view of reality 
is inherently tied to embodied presence. Inherently tied to that. Creation, it was finite, it was limited, but it was very good. One of the ways we experience the fall is the thorns and thistles. This world doesn't work like it's supposed to work. And actually it's those thorns and thistles that remind us that this is not all there is. In the incarnation, God enters flesh and blood. In the resurrection, God restores flesh and blood. In the new creation, we will not drift off to heaven as disembodied beings. Um, I mean, we will go to heaven as disembodied souls for a while, but then at the resurrection of all things, when all things are actually made new, we'll be put in a new physical creation that renews the entire cosmos. So while this personal digital technology helps to push back against some pieces of the fall, it also, if pushed too hard, begins to push back on the very nature of what reality is meant to be, what God intends it to be, and what salvation is intended to be, which is a bodily, embodied restoration of ourselves and of the world. So the personal text, danger to flourishing, go to the next one is we can use modern internet technology unthoughtfully, and that threatens to create an alternative disembodied existence to our embodied existences. That is a habitual escape from embodied existence, but is less fulfilling than embodied existence because it's not the way it's supposed to be. It is simultaneously easier but less than. And the danger is, is as a society and as individuals, we make that trade. We decide to live more in the alternative disembodied existence than our actual embodied existences. VR goggles could be an example if you, it's, it's almost like being stuck in VR goggles all the time. So we lose embodiment when everything becomes virtual. The philosopher Charles Taylor actually uses this phrase, excarnation, and I love it. I mean, I hate it, but like, I love it as a description. It's the exact opposite of what's happening in the incarnation where the spirit, um, uh, where, where the divine um, is coming into flesh. Now our flesh is left behind as we go into this purely spiritual ethereal realm. It's an excarnation that we're doing to ourselves. And then we lose even our ability to be present to the world around us, much less ourselves. And a good word for this is diversion. And we'll talk about each one of those in a second, but I wanna give some examples of how this ends up working out. Zoom is one example. Zoom is easier than actually being together. You don't have to drive anywhere. Don't even have to have your camera on. You can just sit and watch and listen if you want. You can engage if you want to, but you have the choice. But it's also less fulfilling. We are all realizing that because it's trying to mimic personal interaction, but it falls short because we can't see each other's body language. We can't read people's uh, nonverbal cues. We have to pay much greater attention than we would otherwise, because you're just a little box on the screen, as opposed to like your full self in front of you. This is why we get so tired from Zoom. We're having to work harder to get less back relationally. Now, is it better than nothing? Totally. But that's why you're so tired on Zoom. You're working harder to get less back relationally, and that's why it's so frustrating. Porn. Porn is far easier than engaging a real person. There, there are a lot of studies uh, 
about what uh, porn and the constant access to things that provoke lustful thoughts do to our minds and all that is true. It is habitual. It is, it is addicting. But fundamentally, the reason we go to porn isn't lust. We don't need porn to lust. We go to porn because it's easier than actually trying to engage a real person. It's a false intimacy. The problem is not even in porn, the body parts that are on the screen. Because you can see body parts on a medical diagram and it doesn't do the same thing to you. It's the allurement of physical intimacy that draws you in without any of the cost of actual intimacy. It's a cheap path and a less fulfilling end, and it ends up leaving us empty. And it is absolutely destructive. If you find yourself, and I'm just saying this man, woman, whatever, if you find yourself in a situation where you or someone you love has become kind of habitually formed in porn, it is not a small deal. It's not only rewiring your brains, it's changing your expectations for intimacy and, 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 uh, and prohibiting you from actually being able to relate to a real embodied person in the real world. I was shocked when I was a, a college minister. Uh, I guess it was about 10 years ago now. So this was kind of early on in, in some of this transformation. I could not get my guys to go talk to girls because they couldn't get off their video games. They couldn't stop texting with them. It was easier to do those than to actually engage someone. And it has been no surprise to me that, uh, that uh, premarital sex rates on college campuses has tanked because they won't actually meet with one another. There's a small subset that's hooking up, hooking up, hooking up, hooking up, and there are huge swaths that won't even connect with anybody. It's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Because porn is easier than actually trying to talk to a girl. If you find yourself stuck in this world of porn, please reach out. We actually have asked a, a couple people um, to, be, um, to be available to talk about those things. And if you find yourself or someone you love in that situation, please let us know so we can connect you so you can start to have those conversations. Um, because it's not leading to your flourishing at all. Let's go on to Netflix. Netflix kind of pioneered this video streaming technology. Um, and, and kind of getting that into the mainstream. I was struck a couple of years ago when the CEO of Netflix put out in an interview, the, the interviewer asked him, who is your greatest competitor? Netflix thinking they would say Facebook or Hulu or something like that. And the CEO of Netflix came right out and said, our greatest competitor is sleep. Our greatest competitor is sleep. We do not want you to go to sleep and to turn off Netflix. So they make it as easy as possible to get to the next video so that you don't go to sleep. So you watch one more. I, I, you don't need me to tell you that is not going to end up being fulfilling in the long run if you keep going that down. It becomes easier to just watch the next video than it does to turn it off and to go to sleep. Easier, but less fulfilling. Now I wanna dive into, uh, yes, 24, absolutely, absolutely. A great example of a show that was built on the streaming premise, for sure. Our flourishing is at stake, next slide. We are constantly being diverted by our devices. And here's why this matters. More than half of people check their smartphone right after waking up. More than half. 75% check it before they do any spiritual disciplines. 
the average college student spends 20% of class on their device. I actually think that's pretty low. I was pretty impressed with 20%. But the more you check your phone, the more prone you are to depression and anxiety. Our diversion, our desire to escape the world is hurting us. Now this was true as Gina pointed out, long before the smartphone. Pascal, Blaise Pascal in the 1600s, who's known for Pascal's Law, noticed this in his own day. And in his book, The Pensees, in his thoughts, there is an excellent chapter on why we constantly turn to diversions. It's not enough to say that our phones like are addicting us like a drug addicts us, because it's not true. They're not addicting us in the same way. There is something within us that desires to be diverted, that desires to be distracted from the real world. And Pascal in the 1600s really brought this out. He says, the reason why we do this is it keeps us from facing our actual, uh, our actual state our deep unhappiness. Our diversions, even in his day, are an attempt to stave off sadness and create some rush of joy. I just wanna give you a couple quotes from his chapter on diversion. Again, this is all 1600s. Being unable to cure death, wretchedness, and ignorance, men have decided in order to be happy not to think about such things. That's why we turn to this alternative reality of diversion, in our case, electronic, so we don't have to think about these things. He says, I have often said that the sole cause of man's unhappiness is that he does not know how to stay quietly in his room. We can't bear to live with ourselves and the mess that we actually are, so we turn to an alternate ex existence which we can control. He says, the only good thing for men, therefore, is to be diverted from thinking of what they are, either by some occupation which takes their mind off it, or by some novel and agreeable passion which keeps them busy, like gambling, hunting, some absorbing show. In short, what is called diversion. Now ramp that up times a million in terms of the diversions that are accessible to us, and here we are. We don't want to think about ourselves, our faults, our unhappiness, the situation we find ourselves in. So we turn to something that will distract us. And it's that distraction that actually ends up keeping us from God. Because if God meets us in a created world, meets us in the midst of our sin, meets us in the midst of still small voice, if we're always diverting our attention to something else, we have very little ability to listen. Now, one of the things that people might say back to this, okay, we're diverting ourselves into this virtual world. We're constantly escaping into this alternative reality. All right, but like that world is real too, right? The people I'm talking to are real. Isn't the internet real too? Well, yes but we can talk about gradations of real. The internet is less real than being in each other's presence, just as talking on a phone is less real than being in each other's presence, right? There are gradations of reality, things that are more real or less real based on who God has made us to be as finite, physical, embodied beings. And when we ignore that integration of the fact we are embodied beings, we do violence to ourselves and others. We are 23 more times more likely to crash while texting in a car. And what we are doing when we are texting is we are saying, this person that is far away from me is more important to me than the flesh and blood person coming right down the road, right? We're prioritizing something over flesh and blood existence and we do damage. 
Everybody knows about the temptations to anonymous anger online, right? We're way meaner to each other in some virtual context, um, some less embodied context than we are to each other when we're actually face to face, right? We're way liable to miscommunicate and to take offense than we are face to face. That's why you never send heated emails. It's a bad idea. <laughs> We end up not loving others when we discount the fact that we and they are embodied beings and we start to try to, uh, try to live with them outside of that embodiment. We lose our ability to fulfill the great commandment of love your neighbor when we forget that they are embodied beings just as we are. The, the perennial temptation of this is called Gnosticism. I talked about it um, in a sermon a couple of weeks ago, but Gnosticism is the philosophy that, that matter doesn't matter, that the spirit is all that really matters. And it's very common in Eastern religions, and it's very common in our technology. We think that we can bypass the physical, our embodied being, with no cost. When, yes, we can bypass the physical, but there is a cost. It's also been shown that, that immersion in this, um, in this virtual world actually dramatically increases uh, the, uh, the rate of mental illness. And so because we're out of time, we won't get into that at the moment. But I have a, a very illuminating quote if you're interested in that or how that, how that links. Our flourishing is at stake in the midst of this. So now what? Here's the homework for this week. I want you to reflect on your own use of this personal digital technology, internet, smartphone, social media. Be as honest as you possibly can with yourself. What ways does it draw you to fullness of joy? In other words, what ways does it reflect that creation goodness? But then what ways does it cut you off from fullness of joy? What ways does it reflect the fallen curse? Next week, we'll talk about the possibilities from redemption. And there are possibilities for redemption here. The gospel applies to these things as well as any other thing that we've ever come across. But first, we really need to take a good hard look in the mirror and say, how has this how has this changed me for the better and for the worse? Just know that as we get into it next week, if we truly discover things where it makes life better and ways that it makes life worse, where it leads us into fullness of joy and away from fullness of joy, we're going to have to follow up on those convictions. We're going to have to do something about it. So be ready to take a good, honest look and be ready to make some hard decisions as we get into how do we go from here in terms of how we use these devices. All right, it is 8.02. Thank you, friends. Sorry we got started a little late. I hope my, uh, my volume was okay throughout. Feel free to stay on for a few minutes if you want to. I've got at the end of this, um, some resources. The last slide, which is fine, you don't need to bring it up, but uh, a couple books that were helpful to me in processing through this over the last couple weeks, and then a couple thinkers um, specifically that have done TED Talks. If you listen to TED Talks, that are excellent um, and have really opened my eyes to some of these realities. Um, so those are just resources for you in, uh, in, uh, in the slides there at the end for you to look up and check out. So feel free to hang on if you want to for a few minutes or feel free to go. No. Thank you guys so much. Questions, thoughts, comments for those who want to stick around for a minute. Yeah, and this is Glenn. Glenn, bring it. Well, I'm an engineer and I guess I'm impressed that my pastor knows what Pascal's law is. <laughs> I was a chemistry major with a physics and math minor, and my dad was a physical chemistry professor. So this, that's, my, that's my first life. Well, I'm a chemical engineer, but uh, in fluid dynamics, I like that. But uh, physical chemistry just about sunk my career. 
So I was, I was, if I, if I wasn't here, my field that I was headed into was computational quantum chemistry. So I was on the, the quantum chemistry end of things and was bored out of my flipping mind, which is why I'm here with you guys and not in a lab doing computational quantum chemistry. Oh, well. Well, well we're glad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're glad that it didn't work out. <laughs> just, just, just of all, you're familiar with the fruits of the spirit. Yes. Well, the last one of them is, I think, in Corinthians, self-control. Yep. And I think the thing that the technology has helped me understand is I thought I had self-control. And as I'm learning more and more, and it's progressively um, to the point where it's, it's one of the fruits of the spirit I'm struggling with. Mm -hmm. Because I do better in an environment where there's not so many options. And uh, God's given us a marvelous brain. And I always thought that I had self-control, but I guess what I'm finding out, I'm a little short in the spirit on that respect. I'm not quite sure how to, how to manage it. Mm -hmm. It yep. particularly affects my prayer life. I get, I'll be praying and before I know it, my mind is somewhere else. And it usually is coming from the different technology things I have around me. So anyway, very good. Thank you. This has been very revealing. I've enjoyed yes. it. It's scary. And I mean, I think, I think, you know, in different areas of our lives, there are different temptations which come to the fore, right? And I th think we need to give ourselves a little grace. <laughs> and then I think it is perfectly reasonable to say that our self-control as humans has never been tested in the way it is being tested with these devices. Amen to that. Because there are, I mean, there have always been temptations and there have always been, you know, lusts and, uh, you know, sure. greed and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But now it's so accessible and has the potential to be so private, right? There's a privacy. That's actually another like piece of this. Privacy is another value that we don't have to do those things in public and get caught like we used to. We can do it all on our own. And so the, the load, quote unquote, on our self-control is massive. Yeah. It is and massive. self is the wrong word. I have, without the spirit, I don't have control. Mm -hmm. I'm determining. Yeah. So yep. Anyway, thank you. It's been a good evening. Yeah, I'm good. I'm thankful. Thankful. Other questions, thoughts? Uh, this is Gina again. Yeah. Thank you so much for this. Um, I was wondering, and, and I don't know if it's maybe restating what you've already been saying, but it just uh, provoked a question in my mind. Are we looking at technology first and noticing how it exploits our fallen nature? Or should, would it be... I don't know if better is the word, but looking at our fallen nature and our fallen tendencies and how we're, we tend to corrupt everything, um, you know, where is the corruption coming from? Where is the exploitation coming from? And maybe it's both. So it's kind of a question of like the direction of our thinking. Um, and, and then too, is there a temptation that if we feel like, okay, I'm using technology better, so now I'm all okay you know, in terms of temptations and fallen nature. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I understand what you're saying. I see your chat over here, so sorry, I hadn't, I hadn't seen it yet, um, where, you, where you laid this out a, a little bit. I think it's both and. Um, as we talked about last week, like, we shape technology, so we are bringing our fallen selves into it, um, and so therefore our fallen selves are, are shaping it sort of on the front end and shaping it in the fallen directions. But it also, um, it also shapes us back. It, 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 it works on us in ways that we're not even aware in shaping our personalities, both for good and, you know, in some of these cases for ill. So I think it's a both and like technology that's, that's pushing us in a, unhealthy direction wouldn't have power over us if we didn't have a sin nature, right? So in one sense, the fault is in here. But in another sense, 
it is shaping us such that we are open to giving in to that sin nature. Maybe the temptation is increased. Maybe that's a great way to think about it, is that it's by the way it's shaped, it increases certain temptations in our nature. And so we need to be aware of how it's shaping us as well. I think it's a both and. They mutually reinforce one another. Yeah, that makes sense. Are there, um, so this is another question since you've been studying this, are there like social media coaches out there that can help you untangle, um, you know, your usages? So just as a background, my story is we were, as you know, we were missionaries overseas for almost 10 Mm -hmm. years. And so when we got to Germany, um, we're on a missionary salary, which is really, really, really small. And then we don't have access to a lot of things that we had left behind. So it, I realized I was using the internet for everything. I left all my cookbooks at home. So I had to have my computer to cook dinner to yep. find a recipe. Um, obviously talking with our family, we did that via technology. We could not buy English books there. So we had to use the internet to access English books. Mm -hmm. The television was in German and I'd never had a Netflix account, but as soon as we could get one, we did. So we could watch, you know, (laughs) English programs. And, um, and then my job in communications is a hundred percent online, not just doing emails, but publishing things, running a social media page and Facebook makes it really difficult for you to have multiple accounts so that you can turn off your personal life, you know? Um, so it just, I realized there was nothing I, I couldn't do anything as a missionary in an international setting without the internet, without these different accounts. And we're back now, but I've carried all those things back because we're living with another family and everything we have is in storage. And so I really get overwhelmed sometimes trying to untangle all those pieces. What do I need? What do I not need? What do I need for work? What do I not, you know? And so I've often thought, I wish there was a social media coach that you could hire to help (laughs) you, help you figure all this out. Like the apps that you use for banking and um, fitness and tracking your health and all those things, it just, it becomes everything, um, you know, and I can remember a time when I didn't have all those things, but now I can't imagine living without them. (laughs) I have not found a specific site for social media coaches, although I think we could make some killer money um, like setting ourselves <laughs> up as that because so many people feel like they need that. Um, yeah, I mean, next week, you know, what we're going to talk about is like, how do you evaluate and, and kind of parse and, and different kinds of things and, and how do you start taking steps forward? Um, I mean, one of the things I think, one of the things, well, two thoughts that kind of preview next week from, from the book, From the Garden to the City, um, that I was reading as part of this that I thought were very helpful. One is that he recommended each time you use a technology, think about why you're using it. You can't do this all the time, right? But at least like, you know, for a day. Think about why am I using this technology right now? Is it something that only that technology can do? Or is it something that I can do without technology now? Or with like one step back in technology? And his recommendation is to try to take one step back whenever possible into an earlier technological development. When you're engaging with people or when you're engaging with information. There's some things that are only possible with the internet and that's great and that's fine with the smartphone, et cetera. But there are lots of things that are still possible, albeit in a less efficient form, one step back technologically. To kind of gauge your technology use, try stepping back one uh, one step in whatever ways you can, run an experiment with that and see how it changes you, see how it forms you. you because you'll find that that some things have actually changed have actually changed you um and they weren't the only way to do it but yeah i don't know about coaches that's a that's man i, I think there's a business opportunity here truly you open up some social media coaching you'll make some money 
It's got to exist. It has to exist. Somebody has to have done it. I, re I really liked the um, insight you had on the um, how they are tracking you, mm -hmm. maybe tracking you and creating your person, your profile, and knowing what hooks you. Mm -hmm. uh, I I didn't realize that that was. I guess a one, one side of me, I guess, knew that. But what I've noticed in looking at the news uh, bursts that I get, mm -hmm. those headlines hook me. Mm -hmm. Something about it is, oh, really? And then I start reading it. Oh, wait a minute, the content doesn't kind of jive with the headline. <laughs> oh, interesting. I, they were yep. saying somebody did this or was somebody ticked somebody off and you go in this and then you realize, oh, it was somebody else that got ticked off. <laughs> and I, but I got hooked into it and I come away feeling really angry. I feel angry by the headline and it gets me hooked. Yep. And I get angry because they, they sucked me into something that was not communicating accurately what the headline said. Yep. Absolutely. And I thought, wow, this is, uh, but I, but I noticed that I, I'm not known. I don't think of myself as being angry person until the last few years, but mm -hmm. these things get me ticked off. <laughs> <laughs> and the news stuff is where I get hooked the worst. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I mean, insight. Pe people are nervous about like, oh, you know, I'm going to give all my information to the government and they're going to use it against me and et cetera, et cetera, in some future day. And like, that is totally possible, but like it's happening right now in very small, subtle ways all the time where they're using the information they have just to give you an ad. And that seems innocuous enough, but as you said, like it's a, it's a loop that, that, that uh, gets you sucked in, gets you spending more time, gets you outraged, changes your emotional state, and, and changes, uh, changes the way you operate. Tristan Harris has a, uh, has a um, his name is at the end of the slides. He has a TED talk that is absolutely brilliant on this. Um, he was trained in Stanford's Persuade Persuasive Technology Lab. There's a whole realm of technology known as persuasive technology. How can we persuade you to do something just by the way we set up the architecture of a website? Um, and that's, this, is, this is the whole goal. I remember when ESPN.com, for example, went from a couple headlines at the top and you had to click on them to a never ending scroll of stories. I remember when Facebook newsfeed did that too. And like, you can't get to the end of it. It's never ending. Um, that's that persuadable technology. They want to persuade you to stay on. They want to persuade you to click on the, on the, on the element. And so people are nervous about how people are going to use this information in the future when in very subtle ways, it's our, we're already being used now. Um, we make that trade off for the purpose of using Facebook. We decide, Oh, you know, this is worth it for the sake of connecting with my family and friends this way. And that could very well be, I mean, it's the decision I've made, the trade off I've made, but yeah, you, we need to be more thoughtful about it and more aware of the techniques they're using. Somebody described it as, um, in the, in the online environment, we are the prey that they're trying to, to get. It sounds kind of dramatic, but like we are what they're trying to lay hold of, our attention spans. We need to become a predator in the online environment to recognize the tactics that are being used so that we can navigate them in, uh, in ways that lead to flourishing and keep us from not flourishing. All right, it's 8.18. I need to go put my kids to bed. Oh, Mark, I can't hear you. Uh, oh, you're me. Okay, okay. Got it. Got Thank it. You. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm thankful for you guys. Thanks for, thanks for pressing into dystopia. <laughs> Next week we'll be more hopeful, I promise. <laughs> you got to have one hard night, though. Peace, guys. <laughs>